Hey there guys, welcome to my reaction video to Godzilla Mendoza's Arkham Knight's horrendous storytelling video. So, I've mentioned this video a couple of times in my Arkham Knight walkthrough, and I already have a lot of my negativity towards Batman Arkham Knight's storytelling, and a lot of the problems that that game has with some of its mechanics and the like, but here we're just talking about the story, and... There were a lot of thoughts I had towards Batman Arkham Knight's story that I just couldn't put to words. Like, Godzilla Mendoza had actually put a lot of those thoughts into words. And I mentioned before I was going to do a reaction video to this. And he, lo and behold, here is the reaction video that I'm doing right now. So this is a 25-minute, 21-second uh, video. I mean, there was a bit at the beginning, but I had an error that caused the audio to not play correctly. But it doesn't matter because the beginning is not what matters. Uh, he just gives a bit of a, um elaboration on the Joker and the games. And then that's what leads on to Batman Arkham Knight's main problems. But I've been waiting a while to do this reaction video. But let us get started on this video right now. The main villain was a complete no-brainer, and having him voiced by Mark Hamill only further cemented that decision as a solid, of course, why wouldn't you? Yeah, exactly. Having Joker be the main villain in the first Arkham game makes a lot of sense. I mean, he's Batman's nemesis, and having Mark Hamill, Mark Hamill was the staple voice actor for the Joker. So, yeah, they were off to a really good start with uh, Batman Arkham Asylum with the voice actors and with the choice of characters, and I do agree with him here. And it made sense that he'd be a major player in the sequel, Arkham City, because why the hell would Joker just sit one game out if he was in the vicinity of everything going on? That makes sense. Of course, Arkham City's plot did have some problems. Like, for example, that big reveal at the end, where the main villain behind everything wasn't Hugo Strange, but instead was a guy you had already successfully beaten up like four hours ago. Hmm, I suppose that's an interesting take on it, but... You know, it's there to make you not suspect Ra's al Ghul as being the mastermind behind Batman Arkham City. So I can't really fault the game for that. And, you know, they established this with Batman Arkham Origins as well. Batman Arkham Origins takes place before the events of Batman Arkham Asylum and Batman Arkham City. And that audio log you get with uh, Shiva and Warden Quincy Sharp is there to serve as the predecessor to this storyline involving Arkham Asylum and Arkham City, and to think that the League of Assassins were the ones involved with the creation of Arkham Asylum and Arkham City, and it makes a lot of sense given that Ra's al Ghul is the mastermind behind all of uh, Arkham City, and he used it as a way to further his own agenda against the criminal element. I mean, he, he disguises it as such for good intentions, but it's really to further his own power. And I'm guessing one of the main factors that contributed to that was he would be removing major uh, criminal elements so that they wouldn't present as so much of a challenge to him. And at the same time, there were politics to, in play, and therefore he was able to manipulate the politics to start Protocol 10 with the help of Hugo Strange. So I'm not going to complain about that part of the story. I think this is an elegant move on Rock City's part. I mean, there are definitely some parts to Arkham City that are a little confusing. And I mean, a lot of people say that the storytelling in Arkham City is masterful with the way it takes you to different areas, with the way the villains are handled. But I see a little bit differently on that, but not to such a severely negative degree. Kind of took the impact out of it. And then to tie it all off, Joker slides in at the end and reveals he's been manipulating Batman the whole game so he can put himself back on top after everyone else has either exploded or died of a horrible disease. Then it kind of doesn't go so well for him. It was a bold decision to kill off Batman's main villain, and it was probably the best ending for all four of these games. Yeah, I do uh, agree with that. I mean, I, I wouldn't say it's the best ending because, of course, they set up a sequel with Batman Arkham City, Harley Quinn's Revenge, even though it doesn't really touch upon the main ending that well. And it's just a very trite DLC that is filled with so many overused ideas that they just reuse back in Batman Arkham City. But they were trying to build towards a sequel, obviously. And... The whole idea of killing off the Joker right here in the second game, I do agree, is a very bold move. And I do think his death has a lot of impact uh, to the player the first time you actually witness that. And the Joker is such a significant part of Batman's life because he's kind of there to be the culmination of everything wrong with crime. Just 
concentrated into a single individual. And I mean, it doesn't really make sense realistically. And, you know, they kind of overinflate the Joker's uh, abilities a little too much, if you ask me. It's like out of nowhere he knows his technique and like what? I mean, I mean it makes sense for um, the Joker to be like the prime nemesis here and to have him be killed off in this game was very smart. Like for the second game especially, like you'd expect this kind of impact and event to occur in some later game, but in the second game, that is a surprise and I do agree with that. That it was definitely a very bold move for Rocksteady to kill off Joker here. I'd also like to note that with the sudden influx of character deaths, it was apparent that the Arkham games were now in their own universe, and... Uh, I don't know what he means by that. The sudden influx of character deaths caused the Arkham games to be in their own universe. I, I don't know exactly what he means by that. That's one of the confusing parts that he's uh, listed out here. And that thing that I liked about Arkham Asylum is now null and void. Then Arkham Origins comes along and sells us with the fact that it's Batman versus a whole mess of various DC assassins and bad guys. Only to have that fizzle out about halfway through when the main villain pulls his mask off and says, Hey everyone, you're not allowed to have a Batman story with without me, apparently. I mean, it's not that. I mean, it's called Arkham Origins for a reason. I mean, Joker being the main antagonist in Arkham Asylum and Arkham City, it makes a lot of sense for Arkham Origins, the prequel to the Arkham games and the setup of the Arkham games, to have Joker be the main villain. I mean, it's ma I think he's mainly um, pointing out the flaws in the promotional material when they kept on saying that Black Mask would be the main villain and it's Batman against a whole bunch of villains and it made it seem like the Joker was going going to be a uh, side character that you have to fight but in the context of it being an origin story it makes sense for joker to be the main villain and i especially like his origin story in batman arkham origins i love when he goes on those soliloquies when he's talking about uh like his origins to harley quinn and we go through that little sequence it's it's a very uh interesting take on the joker's origins to provide a little bit more context into his uh his psychology basically and his manipulative nature and how he was able to turn that situation when he was discussing with harley quinn to his advantage in order to seduce harley quinn because harley quinn thought that joker was referring to her when in actuality joker was referring to batman I mean, if they actually touched a bit as to how exactly Batman played a role in Joker's origins with actually being involved at the Ace Chemicals incident, I really wish they uh, did more of that. I, I think that would have been a better uh, like introduction to Joker. But for what they managed to achieve with Arkham Origins, and I've said before many times that Arkham Origins is my favorite game in the series. I like the choice of villains. I like their portrayals. I like the Joker's origin stories. I like the darker tone of Arkham Origins. I mean, Arkham Asylum was dark, but there's something about Arkham Origins that I feel is darker than Arkham Asylum, not just in terms of atmosphere and the like, but more so in its subtleties. And I know Arkham Origins isn't considered by many to be their favorite game. I mean, as Laser Z described, this game doesn't focus so much on trying to contribute to the main storyline of the Arkham universe. It's more so there for character progression and to actually build up on these characters. Then it actually focuses on being a main story, which is not how the uh, previous Arkham games worked. But I think that's a very fair uh, assessment on Laser Z's part. And I do feel that Godzilla Mendoza is a little hard on Arkham Origins for trying to make the Joker the main villain, but I mean, it's it has origins in the title. If it's an origin story, then it makes sense for Joker to be the main villain, to actually contribute to Batman's change in his overall style. But anyway, let us continue on. So Joker is the villain of the first game, is basically the villain of the second game, then shows up and steals the spotlight as the villain in the third game, and then in the fourth game, he's... The main villain. <laughs> yeah. Even after he died? Yeah, even after he died. It's it's definitely something that Godzilla Mendoza properly elaborates later on in his video, but just the way they try to explain the Joker being there, all because they, uh, they touched briefly upon the whole idea of the Joker being such a substantial figure in Batman's crusade on crime, almost as a motivating factor. I mean, they, they touched upon this in the comics, but Godzilla Mendoza said, and this was not in the video, you shouldn't have to look at supplementary material to understand basic information. But I guess they want you to imply it in the game, but the fact that they just brought Joker back through a blood disease just doesn't make any sense on a mental aspect. I think this just demonstrates the weak writing that a lot of Batman stories suffer from. 
they tend to always suddenly forget that he has such a huge rogues gallery. If someone once had the gall to say, Batman has all the best villains, why can't we get any of that in these games? It's like everyone else is just a B-lister that's only worthy of being Batman's grocery list of extra bullshit in between chasing the Joker. Yeah, and this is one of the things that I do love about the Batman. And I watched the Batman uh, like a couple of days ago. It is my favorite Batman film of all time. And the, the way they were able to make Riddler stand out as a villain, almost on the same level as Heath Ledger's Joker. I would honestly say that Riddler's portrayal in the Batman, I like it a lot more than Heath Ledger's Joker. I just like the way uh, Riddler challenges Batman and that this he's able to cause Batman to self-reflect on his actions. And that film... I feel like I need to devote a separate video to the Batman because a lot of the points that I touched upon previously with my tangents in my Arkham Asylum walkthrough and in my Arkham City and Arkham Knight walkthrough, that movie just served as payoff to the fact that I was invested in all those ideas that people just weren't thinking about. And it was a brilliant move on the developer's part to really touch upon a lot of those tangents that I brought up in those videos when making the, the Batman. Arkham City even had that weird plot with Hush using stolen human faces to look like Bruce Wayne. We can't make a whole story out of that? Just a minor scuffle in an office where no one gets killed? Yeah, I know a lot of people were left very disappointed by Hush's side mission. I mean, he went through how many surgeries and he even had to get Clayface, like parts of Clayface actually uh, embedded onto his face to fill in the gaps so that his face would look genuine as Bruce Wayne. And he went through so much pain and the like, but it was all to walk past the receptionist and steal money. And it just seems rather one-sided for him to actually think of Bruce Wayne in this simple-minded point of view when he comes across as a, a cold and calculating villain. But maybe, maybe he was always a one-dimensional villain despite his cold and calculating nature at superficial value. But I remember Paul Dini saying that he wanted... Uh, Hush to be the main villain alongside Scarecrow to challenge Batman on a new way. But of course, Paul Dini had left the series uh, after Arkham City, so that never got a chance to come to fruition. Okay, then. Paul Dini left the series and none of the new writers cared enough to try something new and different. It's a brand new universe with no baggage from the comics or continuity to dance around. They had a perfect clean slate and a ton of possibilities for new avenues to explore in a Gotham without the Joker. Then they loosely adapted a comic story and shoved Joker into it. Yeah, I suppose that is a very fair assessment. That is a short but concise way of actually summarizing parts of Batman Arkham Knight's story when they just shoehorned in Jason Todd out of nowhere. And their heavy-handed storytelling led to players just, to, just discovering that the Arkham Knight was Jason Todd very easily. Yeah, that is definitely a pretty uh, short but concise way of actually summarizing Batman Arkham Knight's story. Even when it made no sense, and all it did was serve a contrived function in the plot. Joker being Batman's Tyler Durden is an interesting concept at least, but its place in the story is to effectively handicap Batman when faced with villains he would mop the floor with on any other day. Exactly! That's a, that is a really good explanation right there. T to handicap Batman, to stop him from actually dealing with these criminals, it's just there as a distracting element. And that's all the Joker really serves in this game. He's just a distracting element. He doesn't really contribute so much to the main story. He's just there as a, uh, as a mindless distraction, just at the, at the back of Batman's mind. And it takes away from a lot of the seriousness that the game is trying to go for. Not to mention his entire existence as an imaginary friend for Bruce seems to be just because. Batman gets a dose of Scarecrow's fear toxin, and instead of putting him into a nightmarish drug trip wonderland, like it always does... I don't think it's fair to say, like, it always does. I mean, if you factor in the Batman Arkham Knight Scarecrow DLC when you're in the Batmobile and you're going through that city, I guess uh, maybe it always does. But, I mean, this is a different toxin, though, so it's meant to do something different. But, of course, its effects make no sense because simply having the Joker suddenly manifest when apparently uh, the Titan-infected blood that Batman supposedly cured is still inside of himself, plus the fear toxin. Just having the fear toxin being the catalyst for the Joker doesn't make any sense, because the Joker and his portrayal, it doesn't present in a way that is meant to invoke fear in Batman at all. He's just there as 
comic relief. I mean, if you look at the Johnny Charisma scene, that just further supports that statement. Like, how does that contribute to fear? Why would fear toxin create a whole moment where Batman is just hearing Joker singing in place of Johnny Charisma? That's <laughs> stupid. It makes him manifest the Joker as an alternate personality. If there was any way to have all the tension in a scene disappear instantly, it would be to have Mark Hamill's Joker voice coming out of Batman's mouth. Look at me! I'm amazing! <laughs> so for yeah. consistency, he's a fear toxin induced fever dream. Fine. But the B plot of the game decides to offer an additional reason for him being there. And that's because Batman is slowly turning into the Joker. Which doesn't make any sense at all. I thought I was the only person who felt this, but I'm glad to hear that Godzilla Mendoza and Laser Z actually feel the same way, that this whole storyline of Batman turning into the Joker because of the, the Titan-infected blood, it's, it's absurd, and it just defies all logic. And I know they want to say, oh, this whole condition exists outside a medical record, but even still, though, through a blood disease of all things, and he supposedly cured it from the fountain of youth, essentially, from the Lazarus chemical. I mean, come on. How is that possible for Joker's consciousness to manifest and even retain all the memories he had from the beginning of Batman's career to his death in Arkham City? And he's still continuing on after that. That is absurd. Because fuck consistency! Joker was dying in Arkham City because he pumped himself full of the Titan formula and to turn him into this. <laughs> I'm no doctor, but I can tell you whatever chemicals used to make a person into that are not exactly going to be the healthiest things to have in your blood. Yeah, and he, he even has like bones coming out of him. His whole skin is torn, this and that. How, how do you revert back to human form and not retain any of these extreme injuries and extreme like, changes to your muscular skeletal structure? <laughs> that is something I've never understood about this. And I'm just amazed that Joker was able to recover so well physically, yet at the same time his Titan-infected blood was killing him. So Joker is a mangled mess after the superroids because his ribs are literally hanging out of him. And he decides to donate a ton of his poisoned blood to both Batman and Gotham's hospitals. The Titan formula was what made him and Batman so sickly. Not just that it was Joker's blood. In fact, Joker's blood should be fine on its own. Aside from his looks, he's just a human being. The chemicals at the factory changed his skin pigment and hair color when he fell in. It's not like he was bitten by a radioactive clown. Hmm. So... I'm not too sure what he was referring to there. I mean, I think he was referring to Joker's original blood after he was immersed into that Ace Chemicals bath. But um, I, I'm not too sure why he's talking about that when it's we're, we're supposed to be talking about the Titan infected blood. That was something that was a little confusing about uh, Godzilla Mendoza's uh, part of this video. So Arkham Knight, the game, informs us that for no reason at all, Joker's blood is now making a few random people turn into him. Yeah, and it's apparently due to some form of Curtis Feld Jakob disease, but mutated beyond anything in known medical record. <laughs> yeah, beyond anything in known medical record, at least beyond uh, like realistic medical records, <laughs> just in pure fantasy land. That's what it is. Wait, what? Why? Let's think about that for a second. Joker's entire personality and complexion can be recreated by a botched blood transfusion. Gee, that kind of undermines the whole one bad day thing if it's all based on genetics. Yeah, yeah, so this was one of the most interesting perspectives on this whole idea of Joker's infected blood causing individuals to turn into him. The fact that in a lot of Batman media, Joker's origins are portrayed as being one bad day to actually create this very unique individual, this very unique psychopath, and it's that unique aspect that allows him to be this unique character like it's all based on not just biology but also in psychology as well and with his warped perspective on reality and the idea of humanity and the like but to just throw all that aside and just relegate it to a blood transfusion so apparently if you have the jerker's blood you manifest his consciousness and his psychopathy and his point of views and even his terminology as well some of these people refer to batman as bats how when jerker is the one that should be calling batman bats like it's just 
I totally understand what he's saying right here, and it makes a lot of sense that this just completely undermines the Joker's origins, and it just completely discredits the whole importance of the Joker's existence being predicated upon the idea of one bad day. And in a sense, it mirrors Batman as well, because Batman went through a bad day, and I'm sure some people might say, oh, the other villains went through a bad day as well, but... Joker's case of having uh, one bad day is a very different kind of uh, bad day compared to what the other villains went through. Because he turned into a pure psychopath after this, and he developed a very warped perspective on humanity and the like compared to the other villains who were motivated by, you know, actual realistic ideas like... Um, like money, for instance, or with Mr. Freeze's case, he's not really... A, I mean, I can't really count Mr. Freeze, though, because he's an anti-villain, because that's he's doing it mainly for saving Nora, not to be, like, a villainous person, even though it does come across as villainous. But, yeah, I do like that Godzilla Mendoza pointed out this new perspective on uh, Joker's origins and how they were portrayed in Batman Arkham Knight, and how they completely discredit what Batman Arkham Origins established with the idea of one bad day culminating into Joker's very existence. Or wait, that undermines the entire appeal of the Joker as a character who yeah. can be just duplicated that easily. Does that mean that Joker's mental problems aren't real and are just a side effect of the chemicals? Okay, that's a fair assessment. If blood gives you mental problems. Why is it so specific as to make you an angry anarchist who wants to murder and or sleep with Batman? Why did the poison in the Titan formula not kill these people as opposed to the hundreds that it did kill? Yeah, that's a little odd. I mean, I know, like, you know, these kind of diseases, they always have outliers to them in their outcomes. But still, though, it's poison. Poison should be something that kills them. It's not like they had some accidental exposure to some other natural toxin that just neutralized the Titan a bit. But... You know, these kind of nuances and discrepancies, they have to be pointed out by the developers in the game. That's how the idea of telling a story works. You have to point out these little discrepancies. But Batman Arkham Knight doesn't point out these discrepancies at all. And Roxane never pointed this out at all with these kind of uh, outliers in, in any kind of lore whatsoever in, within the Batman Arkham series. Before it killed him, Joker sent his infected blood out to all the hospitals in the state. I know, we tracked it all down. We missed some. Fuck you. And another thing as well is if Joker shipped his blood for weeks to many of the hospitals and they have gone completely unnoticed, you'd think that the victim pool or the number of people that would be turning into the Joker would be higher than just five people. And I mean five people because that's including Batman. And the, the whole idea of Batman turning into the Joker has nothing to do with the fear toxin, as one guy tried to say in my Batman Arkham City walkthrough. Like, Batman was already well aware that he was going to turn into the Joker before Scarecrow's fear toxin was ever a thing. I mean, we see this in that section where you play as Gordon the day before Batman Arkham Knight takes place. And Batman says that there is a cell reserved for someone who is also going to turn into the Joker. And Gordon asks uh, who it is, and Batman doesn't reveal because he knows it's him. He knows that he himself is going to become the Joker. So it's not the fear toxin, it is the Titan-infected blood. Because fuck consistency, as Godzilla Mendoza said. If Batman drank the cure that is literally made from the Fountain of Youth, would that not just mean he's fine? Why doesn't that work anymore? At the end of the game, when Batman conquers his fears of becoming the Joker, did that somehow magically cure him of turning white and green? Even if he beat the mental aspects of this stupid disease, won't he still have to deal with the physical aspects of- You know what, never mind. <laughs> yeah, that that is also something worth pointing out, although somebody in the comment section of his video mentioned that apparently, uh, this is mentioned at the beginning of the game, but remember in the beginning of the game when uh, Batman and Oracle are searching for Scarecrow's toxin via the manufacturing process where uh, the reaction emits a unique radiation spike? Uh, apparently, uh, somebody in the comment section said that because of that unique radiation spike in uh, Scarecrow's fear toxin this is what allows the titan to be neutralized uh, fully and actually cure batman of this disease while still neutralizing the mental aspects of it with the joker but 
if that's the case, why is it that uh, Joker's presence was amplified even further when Batman was exposed to the fear toxin after Ace Chemicals and even further by the cloud burst? So that's not a good explanation that that person gave. This story decides to make so many unjustifiable leaps in logic that asking real questions about it is only wasting time. However, I am an expert at wasting time. I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip this part, there's no point in uh, commenting on it. I just wanna get over to this part. Joker being here is an overcomplicated way to disguise the fact that both the main villains are as interesting as drywall and have about as much motivation to destroy the city and kill Batman too. I agree. Scarecrow went from being his usual sniveling one-note self to being an unusual one-note self. I am in complete control. Yeah, that is definitely uh, something worth discussing as well. I don't know why Scarecrow's character just had a complete 180 in his personality. I mean, he was a lot more maniacal in Arkham Asylum, but here he's cold and calculating and he has a deeper voice and his speech patterns don't align properly with how he was back in Batman Arkham Asylum. And to think this kind of change occurred because Killer Croc attacked him in Arkham Asylum. And I'm not going to include anything from the comics because unless the developers actually mention those moments in the comics properly, at, at, like in the database entries, like when you go to... um. Like the, the character bios, for instance, or when you look listen to those audio logs after you get all those Riddler trophies. Like, that's what I mean by the database. Like, they have to state the information from the comics within the database. I mean, they did that with Arkham City, because I recall when I was looking through the database in Batman Arkham City, there were uh, key details that were also taken from the comics. I know the comics had the same key details, like what happened with uh, Batman and Selina and the Tiger Guards before uh, Batman Arkham City officially began. But why is it that Scarecrow is so different in this game? It was one thing that I really didn't understand the first time I played Batman Arkham Knight, and I wasn't thinking about it at the time. But to have Godzilla Mendoza voice it right now, I mean, I, I was already having these thoughts before, but to have him voice it right now just brings these thoughts further into the light. It's a very strange 180 in character personality, and it was the same case with the likes of Poison Ivy. I mean, Poison Ivy just came across as being a vessel for this higher power, and, you know, she seemed so out of touch with humanity, like, almost to the point of feeling like she was hypnotized by this invisible force in Batman Arkham Asylum and Batman Arkham City. And then here in Batman Arkham Knight, she looks more human and she behaves more like a human and just someone who sounds like a psychopath. But why, though? Why would they do that? And when you factor in uh, Poison Ivy's sacrifice at the end of her arc, a lot of people love that scene. But when you factor in the change in her personality just completely out of the blue between Batman Arkham City and Batman Arkham Knight, the fact that the developers had to resort to that kind of cheap shortcut in storytelling and with character development just to create that sacrifice at the end in order to justify uh, Batman's moral code and that the villain should always be redeemed. I feel like that was just uh, pants on the head stupid in actually justifying uh, Batman's moral code. And, you know, there's there's definitely some moments like that in Batman Arkham Knight where the characters, they behave very oddly and they have a complete 180 in their personality. But I really feel like uh, Scarecrow is the biggest one right here. Instead of just being a weird henchman who gets off on the concept of fear, he suddenly decides he wants to be the god king of the world and flood the country with his fear gas. Yeah, his ambitions definitely got elevated out of nowhere. And he wants to tear down the image of Batman and ruin his life. And he wants to destroy Gotham. And he wants to be the ruler of Gotham. After he destroys it, I guess. <laughs> yeah, after he destroys it. I mean, we hear these kind of uh, thoughts from villains and many other forms of media where they say they want to be the ruler after destroying a city or a state or a country or the world and the like. But how can you be the ruler over nothing? At least Carla Redame has made a lot of sense. She wasn't trying to be the ruler of anything. She just said that hell will rise and chaos will reign as long as uh, Simmons' world is crumbled around her. She'll find satisfaction in that. She wasn't looking to rule it. Then again, she was, though, because she said, and I, Ada Wong, will be queen of the new world. Uh, she was already lost at that point. It, it's hard to take her thoughts at uh, face value. Maybe she always meant to destroy the world. But anyway, let's continue on. All this because his face got mangled by Killer Croc one time. 
I mean, if it was a simple revenge plot, you'd think he'd be more angry at Croc than, say, everyone else? I mean, maybe he wasn't angry with Croc. Maybe, for all we know, he took pleasure in the fact that Croc actually mangled him, because... I mean, he definitely uh, intimidated a lot of the militia members. I mean, a lot of the militia members thought that Scarecrow's face was a mask, but it actually isn't. And they thought he went through uh, a lot of surgeries just to make him look like shit, rather than actually approve upon his facial features, just to actually embody the sense of fear even more with being a Scarecrow. So maybe he wasn't angry with Croc, and maybe this euphoria he was experiencing, even though it's never explained at all in the games whatsoever, maybe through that moment, that's what reignited his desires to destroy Batman on a new level. Because if his facial features and the fact that Croc actually uh, ruined them, if he was able to turn into a better embodiment of fear physically then therefore his ambitions would have to be of the same proportion. They'd have to elevate to the same proportion as what happened to his face. So I'm kind of on the edge as to what to think about that. Like, Croc is in the city. He's right over there. You have the men and resources to go murder him super hard as payback for your face. No, it's Batman's fault? Okay. <laughs> it's Batman's fault, yeah. I mean, then again, I don't recall hearing any dialogue about Scarecrow saying that it was Batman's fault that his face got mangled. He, he never really mentioned his face getting mangled at all throughout this game, so I don't know what to think of that. <laughs> Wait, what the hell did Scarecrow have to gain from pretending to refrigerator Barbara Gordon? How the hell did he know the fear toxin would make it look like she killed herself anyway? Yeah, that is definitely one thing that doesn't make any sense, but you see this kind of thing a lot in other forms of media, and we never question it, because we understand that he's trying to do something. If the methodology doesn't make any sense, but it's meant to embody the concept that that villain is trying to portray in that moment, that's perfectly okay, but this is a little odd. That Scarecrow knew exactly what, what fake Barbara was going to do in this moment, but maybe he didn't. I think he was a little subtle about it, but... One person did mention that Jason Todd likely conveyed this information to Scarecrow, but I mean, eh, yeah, I, I don't know what to say about this scene. How the hell does he know what specifically Batman would be hallucinating from the fear toxin? What if Bruce's nightmare was that him and Barbara just had sex on a rooftop instead? I don't want to think of that it's movie. It's a really bad idea to imply that the Justice League exists in this universe, because even if Batman loses, Superman or The Flash will probably end up taking down Scarecrow anyways. So that makes sense. <laughs> his lording over the ruins of Gotham won't last long. I give it two days max. Which reminds me, let's take a moment to really run through Scarecrow's plan, shall we? He'll produce enough fear gas in the Ace Chemicals plant to destroy the city, which is now totally vacant, save for his own soldiers and whichever random criminals decide to stick around. Really, the only people who don't deserve getting gassed are the cops. One police station worth of people a world domination plan does not make, but... I still wonder why there's only one major police station. Why aren't there multiple police stations scattered around the islands? That's something that's a little odd. Godzilla Mendoza forgot to mention that the Ace Chemicals plan was to actually uh, cover the entire East Coast in Fear Toxin, not just uh, Gotham. But I do agree that later on, when he's talking about the Cloudburst as if it was his ultimate weapon... What? The Cloudburst only covered a portion of Gotham. It, it doesn't cover the entire East Coast. So what, the Ace Chemicals plan was to have Batman succeed in destroying Ace Chemicals and therefore his ultimate weapon would be revealed? That's a, that doesn't make any sense. So after this inevitably fails miserably, the game starts telling you of his evil, dastardly plan to use a device to blanket the city in fear gas. But this was just like a backup plan? <laughs> exactly! What if Batman hadn't destroyed the Ace Chemicals building? Would they just not even use the Cloudburst? I guess I appreciate that Johnny C over here is being proactive and thinking ahead, but the narrative seems to play it off like this was his plan all along. So yeah, I, I even acknowledged those kind of moments in the game where Scarecrow was saying such quotes in my walkthrough. This was during the, the Cloudburst boss fight, and after you beat the Arkham Knight, Scarecrow mentions that the Cloudburst was his ultimate weapon, but it's his backup plan, so how was that possible? Is he just hoping the Ace Chemicals thing would fall through and wasted all that time setting that up for nothing? 
How about this? Scarecrow attempts to blow the Ace Chemicals building and have Batman come and stop him. But while he's doing this, across town in the district that's already controlled by Arkham Knight's militia, activate the Cloudburst and Batman can't do shit to stop it. Even better, protect that island with all the tanks you have so that the Batmobile would get annihilated if it set even one wheel on the bridge. <laughs> Definitely a very efficient plan, I'd say. I mean, you can't really do the, the cloud burst, though. You can't really put the cloud burst at the same time as Ace Chemicals because uh, Simon Stagg was delaying Scarecrow's plans with the cloud burst, and I guess uh, Alex Sartorius, the, one of the creators of the cloud burst, was delaying Scarecrow's plans as well. And Simon Stagg was doing it for money, whereas Scarecrow was doing it for uh, purely the purpose of fear. So that's one way of writing off the whole plan of uh, the Cloudburst detonating at the same moment as Ace Chemicals. And plus, I think that would just be uh, a little redundant. Because if the Ace Chemicals building is already going to cover the entire East Coast, there's no need for the Cloudburst. And yeah, I just I think it would be a little too convoluted of a plan. So I guess that's why the developers didn't favor that. And the whole idea of the tanks, though, like the Batmobile combat is not the best, and fighting the tanks can be very obnoxious. And Batman doesn't have the best weaponry for dealing with them. So protecting that whole entire island with the tanks definitely makes a lot of sense, even if it seems like the Ace Chemicals plan was just a fluke. And maybe the whole point of it was for uh, the occupation of Gotham and like Scarecrow to abduct key allies. But if he's going to be blanketing the entire East Coast in um, in fear toxin, what would be the whole point of that? Yeah, I do agree. There's a lot of confusion involved with Scarecrow's plan here. I mean, I was already like very confused with Scarecrow's ambitions as well because it just seems like he's go tanks from Dragon Ball's. Like the, the Majin Buu saga, where his plan fails, and then Gotenks is like, Oh, that wasn't my real plan. Here's my real plan, even though he, he doesn't actually mean it. It's like when Scarecrow just sees a failure, like, is imminent. He just suddenly goes, Oh, I have some other plan. Like, it's like, I have, I have all these contingency plans. I'm another Batman. I'm just like Batman. I know I don't have many contingency plans. Like, what? That just seems rather absurd and really stupid and really childish. <laughs> And just downright giving your villain all these lucky passes that just allow them to prolong their uh, futility for no reason at all. I'm sorry, being effective isn't the same as being spooky and savoring revenge or whatever. We both know fear is theatrics, Batman. Scarecrow and Arkham Knight, the person, not the game, are both ultimately undone by their obsession with stupid theatrics. Yeah, and another thing as well is the Arkham Knight in particular, he flip-flops between wanting to kill Batman and then wanting Batman to suffer. Like, pick a darn side already. And it's clear it's due to bad writing. And then Scarecrow just flip-flops between his plans or whatever, and he constantly says, oh, this is my ultimate plan. Oh, no, that wasn't the ultimate plan. This was the ultimate plan. And, oh, the Cloudburst is gone? Well, I'm just going to expose Batman's identity. <laughs> they have all these resources at the ready, and they continue waiting to use any of them until after Batman just got done trashing the last round of new tricks up their sleeve. If they just threw everything at him at once, he wouldn't have any time to adapt, and the game would be over in an hour. Yeah, but I imagine if you were in that universe, you'd think that the large assortment of tanks would be conspicuous, and so therefore you'd be able to plan ahead and maybe stop that whole entire attack. But they didn't bother elaborating on that point. I mean, they did elaborate a bit on how, on how the, the tanks were established, because it was the cumulative funds uh, allocated by each of the villains. So like with Harley Quinn, with Two-Face, with Riddler, they all put their funds together to create $3 billion to invest in this army. But the, the fact that they didn't deploy all those tanks into Ace Chemicals, it would probably have been too conspicuous way too early. So that's probably why they relegated it as such. But I'm guessing... Uh, Scarecrow's threat was the main contributing factor to reducing a significant amount of civilians and police officers in the city. So therefore, there was no need to just put in so many tanks at once, and the National Guard would have been called in or something. And I'm honestly surprised the National Guard wasn't involved in this game. This was a huge terrorist attack, and it culminated over like a huge portion of Gotham. 
and they weren't involved. That is confusing. Who fucking cares if Gotham sees Batman fail? I mean, I don't fully agree with that point because, you know, like, Scarecrow was thinking in the long term about that, but again, if Scarecrow's ambitions were properly laid out and they didn't, like, constantly flip-flop all the time, if he actually stuck to this whole idea of making Batman worthless, to make him feel worthless in the eyes of these individuals who look up to him, that would actually have a greater impact in the long term and influence the future generation. So I totally understand Scarecrow's point of view on that in trying to unmask Batman, but it's like he thought up this plan at the last moment when all of his contingency plans were neutralized. So that's why I can't fully appreciate Scarecrow in this scene, and this is why I can't fully disagree with, uh, with Godzilla Mendoza, because there is definitely something to agree on with regards to that statement that Godzilla Mendoza made. Or if his crusade is ruined. Everyone's been evacuated, and the only people who would see it up close are criminals who are minutes away from biting their own tongues out because you dropped super LSD on them. Jesus, who wrote this? Yeah. Oh, ho, ho, stay off the streets. The floor is lava. Actually, wait, this reminds me of something. <laughs> then again, the Arkham Knight is the second title character and feels like a complete afterthought. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But I'm sure everyone else was agreeing on this point with the Arkham Knight. I mean, the Arkham Knight is one of the things that people talk about all the time with regards to failures to bop an Arkham Knight alongside the Bopmobile. I swear, his entire character was written around getting the word Arkham in the title. That's a pretty good choice of words right there. I need to remember that whenever I discuss something very similar, or at least come up with these other thoughts on other games later on. Jason is a dumbass who does nothing the whole game except talk about how he'll eventually do things, but then just kind of not get around to it. Yep, like I said, he flip-flops between wanting to kill Batman and making Batman suffer. That's right. If you have eyeballs, you've been spoiled on the fact that Jason Todd is the Arkham Leto. I mean, the Jared Knight. So, according to this game's universe, Jason was kidnapped by the Joker and taken to an old abandoned wing of Arkham Asylum to be tortured for months before being fake killed. For some reason, Batman's having flashbacks to events he wasn't even there for! Yeah, so l l listen to this, guys. This scene implies that he had assumed Jason was dead by this point already. Right, because of the whole idea that... It's been six months, and Batman thought Jason was dead, so six months later he has a new uh, Robin. But this doesn't make any sense for this scene to be the case, because then it implies that Batman had the idea that Jason was alive. And got a new Robin. Which means he's imagining a scenario where he thought Jason was dead, but knew he wasn't by virtue of having this flashback at all? And he still can't figure out who the Arkham Knight is? The Arkham. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, if it seems like Batman assumed Jason wasn't dead, and that whole scene that played out in, in huge detail, by the way, and Batman wasn't even there at all. Like, he, he wasn't there when Joker was torturing Jason, and you can see uh, bits and portions of the room and the like, but Batman wasn't there to see what the room looked like. Yeah, that is confusing as to why they would favor that kind of odd choice in storytelling. It's very heavy-handed storytelling to imply that Jason is the Arkham Knight. Knight. So then we're treated to a death scene for Jason, in which he's shot in a video that Batman watches and then never follows up on at a plot convenience. I mean, the thing is, is that in the comics, apparently uh, Deathstroke, I think it was Deathstroke, uh, it could be some other villain, but it was Deathstroke who came in and had actually... Uh, no, no, no. I don't know if it was, if it was Deathstroke. I, I can't remember who it was, but I, th I think it was Deathstroke. I'm pretty sure. Like, w one of the villains were actually uh, tasked by Joker to actually hide Jason's body, basically, so that he's then tortured even further. It was so Batman wouldn't find the body. I'm pretty sure it was Deathstroke. I, I, I could be wrong right there. You mean I mean, it's it's mentioned in a comic. I know it's mentioned in a comic. To tell me that Batman never went. But again, the developers never bothered mentioning this in the database entries. They didn't bother mentioning that one of the villains abducted Jason after this whole moment where he shot, so that Batman wouldn't find him, and therefore the the Joker would be able to torture him even further. And also, how does Jason break free? I don't know. 
But God Solomon does uh, uh, touches upon this point as well. Looking for Jason and just took the video as evidence enough that he was a goner. Well, at the very least, he could have went to go get the body and give the poor kid a proper burial. The real slap in the face about this is that if Jason died in a room of Arkham Asylum, why on earth would Batman not have gone looking for him? I mean, again, he he probably did go looking for him, but one of the villains abducted him. I know this from the comics. But again, Rocksteady didn't bother explaining this in the game. It has to be explained in the game. You can't just use supplementary material like that. You have to express those supplementary details in the actual game. Because then we know it actually fits the established continuity, the main continuity. In the comics, Jason is beaten and killed in Africa, and he still goes to find him. Now they say it happened down the street from his house and he didn't even bother? You dickhead. Instead of dying right off, Jason was tortured for months and mentally programmed to hate Batman, I guess. My name is Jason Todd. Who do you hate? Batman. Instead of use this for something and say, turn Jason into a Joker sidekick to hurt Batman's feelings, Mr. J shoots him in the shadowed region and then does a classic Joker sign off. Did, did Joker just miss and assume this was a kill shot before leaving to go do other stuff? Or maybe he was firing blanks, I don't know. But there's blood. I, I don't know if uh, firing blanks actually creates a lot of blood. But I don't think it's not as lethal as normal bullets. But maybe that was the case here, but who cares? Rock said he didn't even express it here. Did he actually plan to fake Jason's death? How did Jason get out of this situation and go scour the earth for a $4 billion anti-Batman army? I'm pretty sure Deathstroke was his mentor. But I still don't know how Deathstro got involved in this whole moment. Where did he get that money? He, he, been... he got all that money from the villains. Like I said, the, the villains coined all of their cash together to get $3 billion when Scarecrow was announcing his plan. To college? Jesus, who wrote this? I think what pisses me off most about Arkham Knight, the person, is that he's such a half-assed adaptation of his awesome comic counterpart. They butchered his character so monumentally. The appeal of Red Hood is that he represents the flaws in Batman's philosophy. And his... See, th this is what I don't understand, right? The flaws in Batman's, like, philosophy and the like. But everyone keeps assuming that it's Batman's job to capture the criminals and the like. But he doesn't work within the justice system. Batman exists outside of the justice system. He's only ensuring that the, that the justice system does what they do. And he's giving villains a, a chance. Or he's, he's, he's not resorting to killing criminals and turning into a criminal himself. He's ensuring that the criminals actually go into the justice system to go to court and the like. So it's not Batman's job to decide whether a criminal lives or dies. It's the justice system for that. So this is one of the things I've never understood about Red Hood in the comics. The Red Hood is designed to challenge Batman's moral philosophy, but it's like Batman is not the key person who decides whether a villain lives or dies. It's the justice system. I don't know why people are trying to phrase it like Batman is the one that's actually responsible for all that as if he's a part of the justice system, but he isn't. And this is something I never understood about Red Hood. Like... Red Hood should only be formulated as a character as pure vengeance against Batman. Like, they're both vigilantes, but he's the one that actually uh, kills criminals. He's not meant to be, like, this representation of Batman's flaws. He's meant to be an anti-Batman, but one that's actually embracing the whole idea of killing. That's the point. It's not about philosophy and the like. It's, like, the, the Joker should have been dead a long time ago. But do the do the plot convenience, do the writer's bias, do the fact that they wanted to preserve that darker atmosphere that Batman is known for. They make their villains live long, and then they magically escape from prison, and then they make it seem like the prison system is faulty, this and that. I mean, yes, the, the justice system is very faulty in real life, but nowhere near to the same degree as with Gotham's uh, version of the justice system. So, I don't care about this whole Red Hood storyline in the comics. I, I don't like comics to begin with. I never like how they flip-flop between ideas. I just, I want there to be an established character. I don't want the flip-flopping and just overuse of mentalities and, and just ideas. Just settle with one idea and then build your universe around that. So that there's a little bit more of a leash on creativity. And therefore, your ideas make a lot of sense. You're not just pulling ideas out of thin air.
one of the few characters in the DC Universe who can make a legitimate argument against Batman. Again, it's not Batman's job to, to actually cause these criminals to live or die. That's the justice system. So blame the justice system, not Batman. He's he's completely independent of that whole justice system. I mean, he he fights for justice, but outside of the justice system, basically. But he's not the one to blame for all this. The fact that Batman never killed the Joker, or anyone for that matter, is kind of shocking when you find out his adopted son was tortured and beaten to death to prove a point. Again, that's not Batman's fault, that's the justice system's fault. Jason Todd has every right to be angry that the Joker is still walking the streets and killing people on a daily basis. Because it shows less of a moral integrity in Batman and more of just a weakness that anyone could exploit. <laughs> no, no, I don't agree with that. Just, just based on what I've said, Batman is not part of that circle. He's not part of that circle of controversy right there. He exists outside of that. His methodology just completely informs that notion. His fear of crossing the line goes from being noble and heroic to more of a character flaw. How can you say fear? There's a big difference between fear of crossing the line and hatred for crossing the line. Like, fear and hatred are two different things. Scarecrow tries to make them seem like the same thing, but that doesn't make any sense at all. And, you know, like, Scarecrow is trying to say that Batman is afraid of killing, but he's been wrong about Batman so many times. I mean, he literally says in Batman Arkham Knight, I once thought perfectly arranged atoms could unlock the demons in man's mind. You proved me wrong. So, Scarecrow has been wrong about Batman on so many occasions, so therefore, his whole idea of hatred and fear being the, the same thing don't make any sense. And they don't apply to Batman whatsoever. And they don't even establish Batman is afraid of killing. He has a hatred for killing. Like, this was never established in the previous games that Batman is afraid to kill. They try to, they try to establish it in Batman Arkham Knight for whatever reason. And Batman is just doing all these actions that don't make any sense. But that's just the fault of poor writing on Batman Arkham Knight's part. But nah, that's too interesting. Jason should just be mad at him. I want you dead. Hey, look, that's a great opportunity to kill Batman. Or wait, never mind. He's just going to listen to Scarecrow and give up. Well, no, no, no. He's not listening to Scarecrow right there. You could literally see it with the system override. So Sc Scarecrow overrode his systems to prevent Jason from killing him. So, uh, yeah, Godzilla Mendoza sh should have uh, paid a little bit more attention to that. He's going to listen to Scarecrow and give up for no reason. Okay, this is an even better situation. Batman's got a bullet in his abdomen. He's on the ground helpless. He's surrounded by 500 armed men. Just empty that pistol into his jaw and spray his face all over the back of his cowl. Or just not do it, okay? Yeah, and so many times, Jason has said he wants Batman to die, but in that moment he wanted Batman to suffer? Just complete flip-flopping in personality. I mean, come on. What's the point of that? What about now when you have two guns pointed out? Ah, oh, forget it. In a world where pretty much everyone thinks Batman killed the Joker... Yeah, and that is true. Um, I believe there are a lot of people that had those uh, rumors that Batman killed the Joker. Jason's character doesn't have much of a leg to stand on. Yeah, I do agree with that point. And it's made even worse when he tries to explain his anger and only comes off as sounding like an idiot. You had so many chances to kill him. It's your fault Joker got to me. Every good argument he could make is gone. Every interesting angle on his morality is gone. He is totally fine with killing thousands of people and allying himself with a faceless terrorist. Stop! Stop talking to me! They made him a whiny teen brat who turns evil, wears a clunky robot suit, hates his old mentor for no reason, and hangs out with a hooded figure with a deformed face. Oh my god. <laughs> He's hanging out with these creeps. <laughs> He's Anakin Skywalker in Episode 3! Yeah, that is a really good comparison. That is a really, really good comparison on Godzilla Mendoza's part. He's definitely Anakin Skywalker from Episode 3, and just the just the illogical conclusions and just the non secateurs that Anakin goes on in Episode 3 are con very confusing. <laughs> this really does have the writing of a Star Wars prequel. Okay, we've established that the villains make no sense and are complete idiots, but let's talk about the dumbest one of the bunch. It's Batman. He's the dumbest villain. For whatever reason, this game forces him to make every wrong decision imaginable. And it's not done in a way that shows Batman's humanity and vulnerability. He's just acting like an asshole. 
I think all things considered, Tim Drake probably hates his guts after everything that happened. One of the strange things Batman seems to be doing all night is telling everyone how dire the situation is and how this will be the last time they meet after- Yeah, and how does he come to that conclusion as well? I mean, it, it must be like the, the Joker's influence or something. I don't know why Batman thought Joker would actually win in this case, and I'm not too sure why he's selecting this day to be the last day, but it's a, it's very odd. After he helps with their side mission. This is the end. This is the last time we meet. Don't talk like that. It means this is the end, Selina. It means we can. I will see you again, right? No one will. But I can't help but ask, why the hell does Batman think tonight's the night when it all goes up in flames? I mean, Arkham Knight and Scarecrow are kind of bad at their job and he doesn't exactly seem to be showing a ton of symptoms of turning into Bat Joker other than the eye color. Yeah, and this is even reflected in the gameplay as well, with how isolated a lot of the side missions are, with the idea that regardless of what happens in the game, it doesn't have any impact on the side missions, and the villains are just so independent of each other, they're not exactly challenging Batman on a new level. Yeah, so they're pretty feeble in their decision-making and with their planning. And just the, the total uh, insensitive nature on their part, like when the Cloudburst detonates, and then Batman makes it go away, the villains are still doing whatever, everyone is still going about their business, Nightwing is still searching for cars, Catwoman is off being stuck as Riddler's prisoner, and then other things as well. It's definitely a great example of how the Cloudburst made no lasting impact, and how a lot of your actions don't really make a lasting impact. Same with the villains as well. In fact, a slight turn of events and the entire ending could be avoided and Batman could continue his life unabated with everything going just fine. Everything going just fine. I mean, that's not the best statement to make because I've acknowledged many times that Batman never seems to evolve throughout the games. The only form of evolution he's ever displayed is in Batman Arkham Origins. Whereas in Batman Arkham City, there was just more so him going through a, a period where he was feeling down. But in Batman Arkham Origins, I mean, he took Alfred's words to heart when Bane infiltrated the Batcave. And Alfred said that Bruce is not an island, he's a man. And a man is only as strong as the allies he forms around him, not just with intelligence and brawn. And... It's that moment near the ending of the game that really showcased a lot more development in Batman's character than in the rest of the Arkham games. But just going back to my main point, everything would be going just fine. I mean, Batman has a very one-dimensional point of view on fighting crime. Gotham never seems to change as much because the writers want to preserve that darker atmosphere through writer's bias. And Gotham has not changed at all after Batman's sacrifice at the end of Batman Arkham Knight. And I need to correct a statement that I made in one of my earlier videos of Batman Arkham Knight, but certain DLCs take place a couple of months after uh, Batman Arkham Knight, like for instance, uh, GCPD Lockdown. I thought that took place the day after, but it's actually three months after uh, Batman Arkham Knight. It's only Catwoman's Revenge that takes place the day after uh, Batman Arkham Knight. The other DLCs, uh, they take place at different points, but not like days after Batman Arkham Knight. But even still though, Gotham still feels exactly the same. They still feel exactly the same. Like, the, the villains are still going about their business. Nothing has changed about Gotham. They're, it, just, it just feels like... The, his allies are the cleanup crew, not really like something that is meant to influence the next generation. Like Batman's actions in Batman Arkham Knight don't seem to have any lasting impact on his allies or with the villains. And it's just, that's what I mean when I say just having this one moment where one of the characters actually saved Batman at the end of Batman Arkham Knight wouldn't exactly contribute to much because it really feels like Batman doesn't really set in stone the the seeds to actually ensure that the future generation of Gotham actually learn from his like contributions to actually ridding Gotham of crime to actually like building towards something important and you know this was something that the Batman 2022 managed to achieve perfectly they touched upon the, the points that I'm discussing and it really felt like Batman was undergoing a change in his character growth and actually being a figure that is meant to influence the future generation, but Batman doesn't really come across as such in Batman Arkham. I mean, he's definitely at his best in terms of combat, stealth, and 
like moral moral ability, but I mean it's still a one dimensional moral code that he's favoring right here, and he's not favoring more nuances to his moral code. That's what I really feel about this version of uh, Batman and the Batman Arkham series. So I don't fully agree with the statement that uh, Godzilla Mendoza brought up. This is it. This is the worst ending to a game since Mass Effect 3. I know that's a bold statement, but I'll stick to it. I've not played Mass Effect 3, so I don't know how the ending of the game goes. After Batman succeeds in taking down pretty much everything in his path... I mean, not everything, though, because you can still go to the final part of the game without dealing with any of the, the side missions, and it just it leaves a lot of questions as to how the, the continuity of events play out. And you'll, you'll hear um, a, a bit of these points in Godzilla Mendoza's uh, statements later on in the video. As per his custom, the thrilling climax to World of Tanks Batman edition is that Scarecrow is by himself in a room with a gun and two hostages. Yeah, this was one of the things that I found pretty absurd and a little confusing because this is no different to any other Predator scenario that Batman has done. He's dealt with hostage situations like this. And Scarecrow's successful attempt to unmask the Batman was done because he captured two hostages and he has a pistol. Just a pistol. And maybe I think he has armed guards outside as well because I remember uh, one of the uh, militia guards is actually talking about the events that take place because he was outside of the asylum. But he's not, none of them are present at this point. So the fact that... Scarecrow resorted to a commonplace act of criminality that you see in like normal films or like in, in standard basic crime tactics. The fact that Scarecrow resorted to this kind of base tactic and he was able to successfully unmask the Batman just seems rather absurd to me and rather confusing and really surprising. Um, okay. This is Batman we're talking about. I'm not one of those guys who overhypes Batman to death and says he can beat anybody ever. I'm one of those people as well. I mean, I would say that Batman, he's capable of dealing with a lot of these individuals, but there is a limit to what he's able to do, but not a limit that is so severe. And I do the same with Ethan Winters. I mean, I, I would say Ethan Winters is a god. In all honesty, like the things he's managed to conquer in Resident Evil 7 and in Resident Evil Village feel more extreme than anything in the older Resident Evil games. Minus, of course, like the Sea virus or uh, Uroboros from Resident Evil 6 and 5, or even like some other viruses as well. But just the way he's a seemingly normal individual with no fighting experience, and he fights a lot better than the older Resident Evil characters in their first games. He's at a better baseline. So imagine if he went through a very similar training to Leon or Chris, he would be at a whole other level entirely compared to them. But they ruined his character in Resident Evil Village. They made him inferior in combat, just out of nowhere, and it was, it was purely due to poor designs and the like. And then they made him be made out of the mold, which makes no sense at all in terms of the story. And it just breaks the lore established in Resident Evil 7. But I would gladly overhype Ethan Winters and even Batman, although at this point in my life, I don't really have a, the same level of respect for individuals with overpowered abilities or just a slew of numerous abilities like with Goku or Superman or all these other individuals with overinflated abilities. I, just, I feel like there's a lack of respect towards your fundamentals with these characters, whereas I have a great amount of respect to Batman and to Ethan Winters. Although at times, uh, Batman's capabilities can be a little exaggerated at times, but can't really say the same with Ethan Winters, that's what I'll say. But I just have a greater level of respect towards these heroes or towards these characters that only have the right amount of abilities. They don't have a stupid amount of abilities. And, you know, remember when I mentioned before that I feel the Joker is overhyped in his capabilities and that he's just out of the blue able to learn these uh, abilities just in seconds and it's like why are you pulling all these ideas out of thin air like why do you have to overhype your villain or your character in order to make them appealing in order to make them seem special like if you have to literally and superficially present your character this way then there's no value to your character you've designed a shit character 
And this is why I, I stopped watching the likes of Dragon Ball and the like, or with um, with other superhero shows, or with anything that has overly inflated, like, martial arts and overly inflated abilities and the like, because I just, I don't I don't respect those anymore. I really don't. I have a greater respect for fundamentals, and this is why I like survival horror games, mainly, but... Like the, the the main point here being is I would say I'm one of those individuals who doesn't like to overhype their characters, but at the same time I can appreciate at times the desire to want to do that, like Godzilla Mendoza is explaining right here. But this is one of the times where I feel like he could probably handle it. But did you see that quote just then? This isn't going to end how you think, Crane. I mean, I know Godzilla Mendoza saying that this situation seems like something Batman could tackle easily, but I made a mention in his video that maybe assuming that Riddler's side mission takes place before the events of Batman Arkham Knight's ending, Batman is at a point where he feels he's being very inefficient. And he said that... I need to actually pull up the, the comment that I listed. Let, let me actually find it real quick, then I'll get back to you guys. Okay, so here, here's the comment that I left on Godzilla Mendoza's video. I have a couple of thoughts about the ending, but even then, they won't make any sense given this game's confusing story. One thing I can think of as to why Batman acted the way he did with Scarecrow at the end of the game, and why it was easy to remove his mask, is if the Riddler side mission occurred canonically before the events at the end of the game, it may have conveyed that Batman was ready to give up being who he was in order for something to be created that could be, as he says, worse than the legend of the Batman. And yes, it would seem silly if Batman didn't really consider the consequences of having his mask removed, but he does tell Scarecrow, this is isn't going to end how you think, Crane. And he does have the Nightfall Protocol. And for all we know, Batman could have broken out of that gurney at any moment, but maybe he was waiting for the right moment, which is how he was able to break free from the gurney after Jason saves him. However, and this is the confusing part, how does Catwoman know who, Bat who Batman is? Like, Catwoman refers to Batman as Bruce Wayne. Which shouldn't be possible, because there's never any indication that Catwoman knows who Batman is, unless it was stated in a comic somewhere, but they should have acknowledged it in the supplementary material. But the only possible way Catwoman should have known Batman's identity is if the Riddler side mission took place after the events of Batman Arkham Knight, which doesn't make any sense. Like, it'd be very stupid, and that flow of events doesn't make any sense at all. But another possible scenario for this situation would be that the random hallucination that Batman has in the truck where he kills Joker possibly shook his confidence in himself. But again, the Joker storyline in general doesn't make any sense. Anyway, continuing on, maybe in that moment, Batman realized that the fear toxin may play a role in removing the Joker's influence. I mean, I recall that during the whole moment when you're playing in first person as Joker, he mentioned something about Batman and the fear toxin, saying that Batman is trying to exploit the situation to make Joker afraid. And of course, how does the idea of Batman getting his mask removed play a role in this? Well, Batman has acknowledged to Oracle during Ace Chemicals that if Robin couldn't cure those Joker blood infected individuals, the fallout would be dangerous. So based on that logic, Batman didn't care if his mask was removed, if it meant silencing the Joker inside himself forever. I mean, I, I go on to acknowledge that I personally feel the Joker is given too much credit and is really given an absurd amount of notoriety, almost to the point of being a deity, like a devil. And given the way Batman was still maintaining his composure after getting his mask removed, it could also tie into the first point I said in the previous paragraph, how he was trying to create a worse legend than himself. So that's the thoughts I have right now, but I know they won't make any sense, and they only showcase how confusing the story on this game is. That right there was the full comment I'd left for uh, this whole scene right here, and my explanation to Godzilla Mendoza. It hasn't received any replies, unfortunately. But that's just what I feel about this ending scene, even though it, it really doesn't make any sense given how confusing the storyline is for Batman Arkham Knight. Scarecrow has Batman go to this shady-ass warehouse and leave behind his utility belt under threat of executing Jim and Tim. Batman doesn't need his utility belt to get out of rough situations, it just helps. The suit is filled to burst with lockpicks and secret components and pockets. Not to mention probably a dozen types of tracking devices to let Alfred, Nightwing, and Robin know where he is. I mean, he was already acknowledging that Jason was tracking him, and Batman said he knew he would. 
But yeah, I do agree that the whole idea that Batman's entire arsenal is inside of his utility belt and not inside portions of his suit, it seems a little odd. But maybe that's how he managed to break out. Maybe there was a lockpick in his in his glove somewhere, and he was able to use that to break free of the gurney, to actually free his right hand. But maybe he, he always could. That That's what I was saying previously. But... Assuming that Batman did have equipment in his suit, not just in his utility belt. Scarecrow should have easily assumed this, but he didn't. It's like he knew Batman's entire arsenal was inside of his utility belt. And as Godzilla Mendoza mentions right here. So forget all that. The utility belt makes the man. Without it, he is nothing. Yeah. Yeah, that's what it seems like right there. The utility belt makes the man. That's what it felt like right here. I mean, I, I never really considered the whole possibility of Batman having secret compartments in his suit. But, you know, Godz Godzilla Mendoza's video has put a new perspective on this. When Batman is a master escape artist, he should have these kind of gadgets within his suit, not just in his utility belt. But he's able to put all that aside and just go towards Scarecrow with nothing in his arsenal. Batman has a long, weird spirit journey in the back of the truck, and by the time he gets to the ruins of Arkham Asylum, all that's left to oppose him is Scarecrow holding a gun. I mean, that's what the cutscene portrays, but I know there were guards stationed uh, outside of Arkham Asylum while Scarecrow was busy doing his thing with Batman, but I don't know why it wasn't portrayed here. In the middle of this hazy transition, Batman had to consciously let Scarecrow strap him to a gurney while he's holding a gun in one hand, and a glove of syringes in the other. Someone please, for the love of God, explain this to me. Oh, the humanity! If only Batman was some kind of expert escape artist and could figure out a dozen ways to break his mighty bonds. If only he had some kind of special... <laughs> yeah, I know, the fear takedown. ...gun away and take him down in one swift... Month. Yeah, he literally took the guy's gun away. And knocked him down. I'm surprised he didn't do the same with Scarecrow. But again, it's probably because there were guards positioned outside of that truck. But it wasn't portrayed in the cutscene for whatever reason. Who knows? Rocksteady was so confused when designing this game. Oh god, he's so helpless. Someone do something. To coin a phrase. <clears throat> what are you, dense? Are you retarded or something? Who the hell do you think I am? I'm the goddamn Batman. I don't know where this comes from, but why the hell is this version of Batman so egotistical and just self-inflating himself? I, I hate this version of Batman. Just based on that quote, I hate this version of Batman that he's quoting. The reason the ending of Mass Effect 3 pisses people off, or one of the many reasons anyway, is that Shepard suddenly forgets how to talk his way through a situation. If there's one thing he's been an absolute expert at all the way to this point it's convincing people to do things for him or agree with his perceptions and right when he would need that most in the darkest hour of the whole series he just forgets how to do all that because he's tired and injured so instead of convince the reapers to just leave and go fly into the sun or something he acts like a huge bitch and goes along with whatever the star child suggests yeah <laughs> i think you see what i'm getting at here this ending makes Batman just flat out give up and let a B-list villain destroy him. Do you know why he gives up? It's not for any good reason. It's because Rocksteady was tired of making Batman games. So this was all new to me when I actually saw this video. I did not know that Rocksteady made this kind of statement. But it was a surprise when I heard it. This is how the Batman died. You don't have that as the opening line of the game if you plan to make a dozen sequels. Batman himself acts incredibly out of character and borderline suicidal because he has as little regard for his future now as the developers do. They let their feelings about the series bleed into the story. Yeah, they let their feelings about the series bleed into the story. Like, that that line that Godzilla Mendoza said is something I really need to commit to my lexicon. Great choice of words, Godzilla Mendoza. This is only a Batman loses scenario because they wanted to make it clear that they're done and want to go work on other things. The Dark Knight movie series did something similar, but they didn't have all the characters become dangerously incompetent to create this situation. That I agree they with. They built a wall around Batman's main character powers and let it fade out more naturally. 
I'm not saying you can't tell a story where- <laughs> Although I will say though, after seeing The Batman 2022, I don't have an appreciation for the Dark Knight series. I mean, I used to, but now I don't. And like the whole idea that uh, Batman in The Dark Knight Rises just is settling down with Selina and just letting his legacy uh, continue. Um, I don't know what to think of that because I don't feel like he changed much with Gotham. Whereas I feel like in Batman's second year, which is what is portrayed with uh, with the Batman, I feel like he was leaving a, a better lasting impact or something. At least in his transition from a, a vigilante to a superhero. This is something that I feel uh, the Batman did better, but I don't know how best to explain it. Where Batman effectively ends, they've done that a few times actually, I'm saying you can't do it in such an insulting way. And I'm not saying this game completely sidesteps any interesting themes or character growth, but when the circumstances surrounding those are so pants on head stupid... <laughs> Gotta remember that line, pants on head stupid, which I've already said many times before. It's hard to take them seriously. <laughs> Batman succumbs to his weird mind trip with the Joker for a bit and soon figures out a way to overpower his personal boogeyman. Cool, fine, whatever. Where the hell are any of his friends? Yeah, I know. Make your way to my location now. Nightwing and Catwoman are both in the city right now doing their own thing. Remember in Arkham City when Bruce gets trapped under a pile of debris while the city crumbles outside? And Catwoman had a change of heart and went back to go save him instead of Bale? It tied up the two plots nicely and gave her a greater purpose in the story than just being filler. Only in that one moment, the entire Catwoman storyline from Batman Arkham City is dreadful. It doesn't serve any purpose to the main story. It's just Selina doing crap. And this was the only moment where her storyline actually had any sense of, like, importance to Batman because she straight up saved him from Protocol 10. But that's the only part that actually matters, and they didn't do the same with Batman Arkham Knight. Even if you didn't free her yet in this game before this, Nightwing is still out there doing nothing except searching for suspicious looking white vans. And he seems pretty committed to that. Even when it is such a trivial issue compared to what Scarecrow is doing and what Batman is going through right now with getting his mask taken off. Yeah, I agree with Godzilla Mendoza. That doesn't make any sense. And if this takes place after you beat both of their side missions, than two people who care about Batman a lot. See, see th th this is the thing as well. This is what I was mentioning before. You don't know how the, the continuity of events play out in Batman Arkham Knight if you choose to do the, the final part of the game before or after you do the side mission. So which one is the correct scenario? It doesn't make any sense. Lover and his son both hear him saying cryptic shit about how he's going to die tonight. Neither of them are concerned enough to follow up on that. I won't. Yeah, neither of them are concerned to follow up on that. Yeah, I do agree with that, and I need to remember that line. Let you down. Thanks, Dick. I appreciate it. So instead of the logical option, we get Jason Todd swooping in to save the day a whole five minutes too late. Why the fuck did he even bother coming back here? Him and Batman never really made amends, he just beat him up and said sorry. Yeah, it was pretty abrupt, but maybe Jason always held a bit of respect for Batman, I don't know. But it should have been portrayed a bit better. I'm so and if and plus if his character was done a lot better throughout the entire game, then maybe this whole scene would have made a lot of sense where Batman simply says, I'm sorry, and then Jason is able to uh, reconnect with his mentor. Sorry. That was enough for Jason to pull a complete 180 and go save him? Man, if only his problems were always solved this easily. Hell, he could just go up to Two-Face and apologize for mangling both halves of his head and Harvey would return to a life of politics. Well, he did that technically if you did Harvey's side mission after you beat the Scarecrow's arc in Batman Arkham Knight, but it still didn't work. Well, well Batman is outed and his life is over, I guess, because everyone gave up. So after 19 hours of grinding on the side missions, he mysteriously stumbles into his house... Yeah, g grinding on the side missions. I, I don't know why uh, Rock City opted for this kind of choice and pacing, where the side missions are so integral to the main story, yet they can feel a lot like busy work in a sense. And, you know, if they actually integrated them into like a single like main storyline progression rather than just relegating them to side missions, maybe there would have been some sense of that, but 
then again, that would have interrupted the flow into the story. But even then, the, the story in Batman Arkham Knight is not handled very well. And, you know, because of the amount of busy work you're doing, you're forgetting events that played out. And you're forgetting the impact that those events are meant to lay towards the player because you're too busy doing, like, Riddler challenges or other side missions. It explodes on live television, and then a bat person, presumably using fear toxin... See, presu why do people always assume that it's fear toxin? I get it has the orange hue, but they had the assets for this whole orange hue and bat persona laid out in that final cutscene with Scarecrow when Scarecrow is injected with the fear toxin, and in their laziness, they probably wanted to reuse assets, but... Why would you assume it's fear toxin? Batman would never resort to that. That's not his character. Batman would never resort to using a cowardly tactic like that on the same levels as his villains. He'd be becoming the villains in this case. And if he was to be partaking in the use of fear toxin, then he's saying that if the villains had such success with their methods, why don't I do the same as them? It just feels like he's giving up. If he comes across as him giving up, actually doing things in a more efficient manner and just favoring like the, the cheap shortcut that just has a lot more consequences almost like cole favoring the evil karma route in um in infamous and that i need to talk about in a completely separate video because i read something related to evil karma in infamous but I, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to discuss it right here shows up in the epilogue to gobble up some criminals congratulations everybody this is what this entire award-winning series was building up to was it all worth it it was not worth it, and I really don't understand the whole point of this bot symbol and this bot person appearing at the end. What is it building towards? It's not building towards anything related to Gotham. It's not building towards anything with the allies. It's just so out of the blue. Like it's, it's really confusing why they would opt for this kind of anticlimactic ending. I also took the clip off of YouTube instead of getting it myself because Riddler trophies. That's funny, too, because a lot of people just say that uh, Batman Arkham Knight's true ending is the Riddler boss fight. Because so many people beat the, the game story before actually partaking in the full Riddler challenge and actually uh, dealing with Riddler. God, what a mess. I'm surprised more people aren't tearing their hair out with anger at how this game turned out. Yeah, the DLC stuff was pretty cool. Yeah, the graphics are great. Yeah, the voice acting is stellar. But everything else is either underwhelming, overwhelming, or just stupid. What the hell happened in the development process that led to all these poor choices? Rockstar yeah, I could say the same thing about New Capcom's development team with Resident Evil Village. They have to be the dumbest development team I've ever seen for a Resident Evil game. So many like major mistakes were made with that game, and yet they could have easily been avoided. Rocksteady didn't close out the series in a satisfying way. Yeah, yeah, just just like what I mentioned with that ending, with that bot symbol at the end. They just rushed it into an Arkham grave so they could go develop... Hell, I don't know, maybe they're making a Justice League game or... Well, we know what Suicide Squad killed the Justice League now. ...something now. I think I felt so compelled to review this game because some of its flaws are so massive, yet avoidable. I wish I had that same motivation for... Resident Evil Village, because I would gladly do a review for Resident Evil Village, because so many mistakes were made with that game, but avoidable if they actually had brains. And th this definitely serves as additional motivation for me to do a review of Resident Evil Village when I get the chance. There is so much wasted potential here, and that's worse than just making a game that's bad. Yeah. It's a game that's mediocre at best, even though it could have been amazing. If the Batmobile was used sparingly, if the script had like eight more drafts to iron out all the nonsense, if Harley Quinn wore this the whole game, if the gameplay felt more balanced, if the side missions didn't feel like busy work, if the boss fights didn't suck, if the Riddler segments were actually fun and challenging instead of just tedious, if the mask fit on Batman's face in a way that didn't look horribly tight and uncomfortable, then it would have been a fantastic game. And there is nothing worse than stumbling right before the finish line. On the positive side, there's no way this will be the last Batman game of its kind. I'm sure if a different developer doesn't pick it up, Rocksteady will start a new series that borrows design elements from this one. And lo and behold, we got Gotham Knights, which looks really bad. The gameplay for Gotham Knights looks atrocious. I mean, I know it's a pre-alpha build, but still, though, I've seen better pre-alpha builds of games than what was listed with Gotham Knights. Yeah, the animations just look like crap. And there was just so much flip-flopping between the animations and the transitions didn't look right. And I'm really excited to see where the Telltale series goes after its first season. 
I just wish this one had turned out differently because I love the Arkham games. They're some of my absolute favorites. And I feel like it's a series that deserved better than to end up like this. Yeah, Keep in it, mind, it really did. If this is your favorite game ever, for whatever reason, that's totally fine. My opinion is not fact, and you aren't wrong if you like things about this game. Let's just skip all the, No nah, man, this game is perfect, you're just a hater, bro, comments. I can't afford to lose any more brain cells, we're down to double digits. <laughs> now, with that being said, is Arkham Origins actually that bad? Now I think about it, that one had some neat stuff in it, despite being kind of cheaply made. Shit. Yeah, cheaply made in the sense that it was badly optimized. The PS3 version's atrocious. The frame rate is garbage. There's a lot of bugs in Batman Arkham Origins. But minus all that, Arkham Origins is a fun game, and it's my favorite game in the Arkham series. Yeah, I'm gonna go fucking play that one again. Oh, guess that's the end of the Arkham Knight. And that is the end of Godzilla Mendoza's video. So yeah, I'll, I did say a lot. There was definitely a lot to say, and for once, it's not a Resident Evil video, because I did a lot of reaction videos to Resident Evil content, but this is the first time I'm doing a reaction video to a Batman Arkham game, and it was worth it, because Godzilla Mendoza made a lot of really good points right here while still making it a comedic video. He didn't let his comedic value just completely uh, supersede his objectivity. There are a lot of objective comments here, but there were still some stuff I disagreed with on the subjective level, but I think he definitely did a great job in putting to words a lot of the thoughts I had towards this game, but just couldn't put to fucking words. But that is the end of this reaction video. Thank you all for watching, and you take care now.